Hello, everyone. Peter Maravellis here. I hope this finds you all safe and well. On behalf of City Lights booksellers and publishers, I'd like to welcome you to City Lights Live, the virtual reading series that continues in the footsteps of our in-store calendar during the time of the pandemic. We continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums moving into the winter season. Uh, before we begin tonight, I feel compelled to say a few words about something important to us. As many of you know, our founder and guiding force here at City Lights, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, passed away a couple of nights ago. He was 101 years of age. For over 60 years, those of us who have worked with him at City Lights have been inspired by his knowledge and love of literature, his courage in defense of the right to freedom of expression, and his vital role in really as being kind of a cultural ambassador. Um, his curiosity was unbounded and his enthusiasm was infectious to all of us. And we will miss him greatly. Uh, we feel the impact of his passing. So it's been especially moving and meaningful to receive so much love and support from the community at this moment. So on behalf of our director and our staff, we'd like to really extend our gratitude to everybody. Thank you so much. Um, for just how much care and love you have shown us at this moment. Um, and just showing us how much Lawrence's work meant to all of you. It means a great deal to us. We feel the love. Uh, some have asked what will come of City Lights. Uh, our answer is really quite simple. Lawrence left us with a very strong legacy. Uh, it's one which we will honor uh, in the books that we publish, in the stock that we carry in the store, and the events and community outreach that we engage in. Uh, those of us who were fortunate enough to stand in the light of Lawrence's brilliance now have the responsibility to keep his vision going. So it is with great pleasure that we're going to move forward and continue espousing the values that City Lights has stood for since its inception. Uh, we intend to build upon Ferlinghetti's vision and honor his memory. We will continue sustaining City Lights into the future as a center for open intellectual inquiry and commitment to literary culture and progressive politics. Uh, so though we mourn his passing, we celebrate his many contributions and really give thanks for all the years we were able to work by his side. So with all that said, we move on to the subject at hand tonight. We are delighted to be celebrating a remarkable new book. It's titled Liner Notes for the Revolution. The Intellectual Life of Black Feminist Sound. We are happy and honored to have with us tonight its author, Daphne Brooks. The book is published by Belknap Press, which is an imprint of Harvard University Press. Uh, it's an important new work that explores more than a century's worth of music archives to examine the critics, the collectors, and the listeners who have determined perceptions of Black women on stage and in the recording studio. Uh, Professor Brooks asks the important question, how is it that iconic artists such as Aretha Franklin, Beyonce, and many, many others exist simultaneously at the center and on the fringe of the cultural industry? So a few words about our author tonight. Daphne Brooks is the author of Jeff Buckley's Grace and Bodies in Descent, which was the winner of the Errol Hill Award for Outstanding Scholarship in African-American Performance Studies. Uh, a professor at Yale University, she's written liner notes to accompany the recordings of Aretha Franklin, Tammy Terrell, and Prince. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, The Nation, and Pitchfork. She's going to be joined tonight in conversation by Ann Powers. Ann Powers is the NPR music critic, uh, NPR uh, music's critic and correspondent, and the Nashville correspondent for WXPN's World Cafe. She writes for NPR's music news blog, The Record and she can be heard on NPR's news, news music magazines and uh, music programs. She's the author of numerous books, including her most recent, Good Booty, Love and Sex, Black and White, Body and Soul in American Music, which was selected as one of the best books of 2017 by the Wall Street Journal, No Depression, NPR, and BuzzFeed. Uh, in 2017, she founded Turning the Tables, an ongoing project of NPR to recenter the popular music canon to be more inclusive of marginalized and underestimated and forgotten voices. So before we start, I'd like to let you know that we're gonna be posting links in the chat function with which you can purchase books. Uh, we'll also be taking questions and comments from the audience in the same chat function for the Q&A at the end. So please do post your questions there. 
So it is a great honor to have both you with us, Daphne Brooks and Powers. Welcome to City Lights Live. Oh, you've been muted. Let me unmute you. <laughs> Hi, now I'm unmuted. Awesome. Hi, yeah. thanks for having Welcome. me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter. That was such a lovely introduction. A and beautiful I think, introduction. And we both would are joined in our sense of expressing condolences to the City Lights family. Um, the loss of Lawrence Ferlinghetti is one that I, I, I know is felt by the both of us as, as folks with ties, deep ties to the Bay Area and to City Lights. So yes, it is a moment to Absolutely. reflect. Yeah. A moment to reflect and to reflect on lives well lived and on uh, a mm -hmm. century of American culture, which Lawrence Ferlinghetti uh, witnessed right. and That's right. creating and, and to reflect on creating legacies and yes. and Daphne, your book so beautifully uh, what a transition. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they pay me the big bucks. I know. <laughs> uh, your book so beautifully traces a lineage and lineages that that have been in some ways celebrated and others been completely subterranean, as you say. I would love to open up this uh, this discussion, this conversation by hearing a little of your beautiful prose, which I value so deeply. So can well, you thank read? you. Can you read? Thank a you part? so much. And powers it. I'm happy to read. And I will preface that by saying um, that so much of what I learned about how to write about music came from reading the great Ann Powers. And I was, as the kids would say now, a stan of Ann Powers, <laughs> like so many of us, um, you know, coming through graduate school and really finding that feminist voice in, in the dailies um, just out on the front line. So, so thank you for paving the way. Um, I'll read uh, just a, a few paragraphs from the opening pages of the book. Um, and here is the book, by the way, it is a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice volume that you can use to work out with um, <laughs> in addition to reading. Um, Quiet as it's kept, Black women of sound have a secret Theirs is a history unfolding on other frequencies while the world adores them and yet mishears them, celebrates them and yet ignores them, heralds them and simultaneously devalues them. Theirs is a history that is nonetheless populated with revolutionaries. Turn of the century vaudevillian Muriel Ringgold rocking her entirety in full costume as the sea, an actual character she played. Blues trailblazer Mamie Smith breaking the era era of modern records wide open all crazy and staggily style love. Opera ingenue Anne Brown rewriting best to Gershwin's Porgy. High Priestess Nino orchestrating a Brecht and Vile tempt, Tempest aimed at overturning Jim Crow. And Slinky Af Afro-Cosmopolitan Eartha staging her own geopolitical cabaret. It's a history wide enough to encompass rebel with her own cause, rock and roller Etta James in a fast car out on the open road, and folk historian Odetta going deep into scholar, thinker, rule breaker Zora's precious vault so that the real work songs can begin. It's teen Aretha in shimmering sequins attacking Al Jolson's Swanee and those glam ambassadors, the Supremes, pointing us towards somewhere one day after a king had been slain. It's the body and soul of a grown ass musician building bridges over troubled water for her listeners. The electric kinetics of anime Bullock breaking free from domestic tyranny. Funk philosopher Betty Davis inventing her own erotic lexicon. An intergalactic trio LaBelle delivering Afrofuturist theory all up in the club. Theirs is a history of the utopic and the transformative the strange and the strategically unruly, Diana reaching out and touching the hands of the multitudes in the Central Park rain, Afropunk godmother Grace driving Atlantic world nightlife right to the edge while polystyrene and skin work on burning the whole house down. It's Whitney's melisma lighting up post-civil rights America and it's Ms. Hill with her renegade contralto scoring a thousand turn of the century sorrow songs for the hip hop generation. It's a hardworking H-Town new millennium storm system performing radical 
black pop feminism to fight catastrophe. And it's her avant-garde genius baby sis staging a blackest of black uprising right in the center of the lily white Guggenheim. Theirs is a history of game changing art that stands as an affirmation of our past, as well as the unrecorded future of sound, that which is booming in the not yet, the place where all those sisters of the yam are running us straight into the dawn. Beautiful. I'm so glad you shared, just because we can all get a, a feeling for your luminous prose. <laughs> so, so thank you for that. I want to get into some of, you know, your writing is amazing. Your ideas are so provocative throughout this book. And uh, I want to jump right in and talk about the framework a little bit of the book. Um, in the introduction, you invoke three thinkers in one at one point, Bob Dylan, Ralph Ellison, and Farrah Jasmine Griffin, uh, to both interrogate and set into motion the power of the word subterranean. Um, and that inquiry leads to a question that you pose. What is, and I love this question, Daphne, what does it mean to be the source of epiphany, the gateway to transcendence for others? You're talking about black women's voices. And then you ask, what would it mean to reckon with the ways that black women's voices are indispensable to modern sound? So let's talk a little bit those about those two different questions because tracing sources demands an expansive approach that hones in on particular particular points as a progressive, but it's, you know, open-ended, like the idea of going subterranean, you go everywhere subterranean, right? But then mm -hmm. indispensable uh, mm -hmm. suggests discernment and a rigorous assessment of what really matters. Mm -hmm. So how did you keep those two spirits alive, the mm -hmm. spirit of expansiveness and the spirit of discernment as mm -hmm. you did this project? Oh my God, what a brilliant question. <laughs> you know, um, so I, I think I'm going to come at this through um, talking about the inspiration um, that I derived from one of the figures that you mentioned in particular. All three are very important to this text. Farrah Jasmine Griffin, 20 years ago, was the first Black woman to publish a full-length study of Billie Holiday. Before that, mm -hmm. it was nothing but dudes and white folks. <laughs> so um, she's hugely important to my thinking beyond beyond in the same way that you are. Um, you know, and, and, and Dylan, I mean, there was a period of time in which this book was actually called Subterranean Blues, and that now encompasses a larger kind of field of study that I'm promoting and other projects related to this book um, in, in terms of, you know, kind of a riff on subterranean homes, right? So, um, but Ralph Ellison's uh, 1952 masterpiece, the greatest American novel, in my opinion, Invisible Man, <laughs> Um, you know, give or take some Toni Morrison in there, but certainly one of one of the greats um, has so much to do with thinking about um, space and um, the ways in which in Jim Crow America, African Americans were not afforded space to be seen, to be legible, except through the prism, of, obviously, of anti-Blackness. And so um, the wraparound kind of structure of that book is to imagine, um, you know, the, the kind of the space of the underground in which Black folks can kind of reimagine and reconstitute their selfhood on their own terms. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was trying to... Um, but invite people in at the beginning of um, of the journey that I'm I'm going on um, to thinking about um, the ways that Black women musicians create other spaces, other mm -hmm. um, sites of alterity um, through their music that was a, a source of um, sustenance and survival um, for the very reasons that Ralph Ellison and many others lay out um, in his narrative, right? Right. On the other hand, um, the aesthetics of Black musicking um, from the moment of captivity, which is very important to the story that I'm telling too, how to think about popular music culture broadly through the prism of 1619 and mm -hmm. what it meant for people to be brought here in bonds and turned into commodities um, and how that affects how we think about popular music culture across the board. But that kind of terrible, wretched, um, transgenerational, multi-century um, form of terror yielded all sorts of very specific um, as musical aesthetics um, as a mode of survival. Um, so in that sense, there is something very um, distinct that African-Americans brought to popular music culture by way of having to navigate 
expressive modes that could speak back to and reject the terror in which they were entangled. So I don't know if this is what you're getting at, but the kind of the discernibility is about, yeah. we're going to have to come up with ways of asserting the specificity of who we are as humans. And right. sound right. seems to be a good place to go since it's illegal to learn how to read. Right. Let's <laughs> right. try that. Right. Right. I don't right. know what that. Well, I was also, I mean, that I was, I was also curious about just like this in that sentence, the, the, uh, the word indispensable and like as critics, uh, you and I are mm -hmm. tasked supposedly with making decisions about who is indispensable and who is not. Now right. this actually echoes interestingly with ver the very, uh, subject that you, you've put at the center, because mm -hmm. the idea that any human expression would be dispensable you could yes. argue is right. highly problematic right. and and is but is also uh interwoven with the history of of racist yes. oppression and white supremacy in this culture yes, yes. So, so how how to choose the in indispensable uh. while still honoring uh, <laughs> everything else um in terms of artists or in terms of because in terms of yeah. your narrative yeah right in terms of my narrative okay sure right um you know, I felt like it was important to actually to pay attention to the icons who appear um, in pointed at pointed moments and yes. transitions in the book, but to actually work around the the margins of popular music culture to think not only about um, you know amateur musicians like Esther May Scott, she actually becomes a professional blues musician, but for a portion of her life, she's working um, doing domestic work in the South. And you know, in her in her off time, in her limited off time, she was going to the juke joint to to listen to Bessie Smith um, right. and and hang out with Lead Belly. Um, but so I kind of wanted to think very expansively about who matters in relation to popular music culture, about the fact that you can have fans and amateur musicians as well as record collectors and music critics, mm -hmm. um, and you know, independent um, you know feminist. Uh, blues record label owners, you know, as, as part of the kind of larger, the culture that we consume in relation to popu popular music. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and all of those figures are indispensable um, in as much as they, they create a broad kind of panoramic experience of how we have access to what we have access to, how and what we have access to um, in popular music culture. Um, right. yeah. so, so nobody's indispensable. Right. It's just two <laughs> stories end up getting valued um, and which ones don't and, and who's in control of the valuing is, an, is another piece of the book that I really wanted to put pressure on in my story that I'm trying to tell. I'm nodding vigorously as always when Daphne talks to the audience because I always think she's so brilliant. So I, I don't think I have control over my own muting. So I apologize. <laughs> If you have a little uh, scratching going on <laughs> with this microphone, um, well, let's talk about uh, a key figure in your in your narrative who opens the door, uh, and who is you call the progenitor of your story because this this mm -hmm. character is multivalent and in fact embodies every role you've just mentioned almost, mm -hmm. and that is uh, Pauline Hopkins. Mm -hmm. So sh she's such an interesting. Uh, mother in this story uh, figure. So uh, tell us all a little bit about her and why she is positioned in this key place in your narrative. Yeah, well, she actually, thank you for that question. She closed out uh, my first book, which was an academic study. Of, uh, <laughs> a of, great one. Uh, <laughs> of, uh, yeah, I mean, but thanks, but, you know, very, very much positioned within the academy, but trying to do a lot of work around thinking about Black performers who, who I actually called, um, you know, the, our first rock stars, you know, people like Henry Box Brown, who mailed himself out of slavery. If that's not rock star, I don't know what is, <laughs> um, even as we take apart that kind of formulation. Um, she's the last, one of the last figures in that book. Um, and she's, she's so fascinating because she was a, she was a vocalist with her family during the period of reconstruction, which we know a little bit more about now in this moment of racial reckoning, since we're going through, some would argue, kind of a third post reconstruction era. Um, so she was a vocalist during the Reconstruction era, um, and then she transitions into becoming this 
just fiery black nationalist journalist, um, sentimental novelist. So she's writing kind of um, sensation fiction that is actually tied to anti-lynching politics. So um, she, along with the great Ida B. Wells, who's her iconic um, um, uh, rebel with a cause, anti-lynching journalist, and a whole cadre of other black feminist activists um, in the 1880s, 1890s are, are using literature to, to fight anti-blackness. And so the thing about Hopkins is she's doing this through culture and one of her novels actually uses this protagonist, puts forward this protagonist who's a Fist Jubilee singer and who's tied to spiritualism and um, you know is then tied to a black diasporic cultural imaginary. I've argued in this book and elsewhere that Pauline Hopkins is our first black feminist music critic because she actually uses her novels to, and especially this one novel of One Blood, which is written the same time that W.E.B. Du Bois, who's also in Cambridge and Boston, right alongside Pauline Hopkins, but he never shouts her out. They have a lot of the same ideas about black liberation, mm -hmm. but in her book, she's really thinking about music as, um, as a liberation practice and um, black women's vocalizing as liberation practice. So she's, she's the, the godmother to me of the kind of the beauty of being able to write the story of black women's music. Um, and that's an important part of this book is to kind of just think about what does it mean to be a fan of the music and to wanna to document it through prose and make meaning out of it. And what does it mean that institutions and people in power didn't feel like they needed to write with serious engagement and rigor about black women's music for many, 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 many years. Yes. Or if they did, they didn't feel like they had to engage in any kind of sustained real immersion in the socio-political and material history of African-Americans. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, this leads beautifully into my next question because, you know, you, you're redefining the role of the critic. You're, you're, you're challenging uh, us to think expansively about the role of the critic and you are counterposing artists and critics, but also showing how artists are critics and critics are artists, which I, of course, as a critic myself, love. And, you know, you do this by ex exploding the notion of the critic, reminding us that artists like Abby Lincoln and Janelle Monet were not only literally writing criticism at times, but in their own music were enacting and performing a, a form of criticism. Mm -hmm. But what is the dynamic between those two terms for you, artist and critic, so often separated, almost uh, alienated from each other yes. by the institutions of uh, canonization? Yes, yeah, no, that's so beautiful. I mean, I think for me, I really wanted to approach those two roles and the entanglements between those two roles from the standpoint of a dispossessed people who were devalued across the centuries. Um, the late, great Lyndon Barrett, um, one of my dear colleagues who's passed on, um, wrote very beautifully at the turn of this century about blackness and value and how we need to really think about the, the kind of systems of thought that devalue blackness. And so mm -hmm. I, wanted to, I wanted to come at this question of the, these two roles and why these two roles um, intersect so profoundly in African-American culture because of the necessity of black folks having to figure out ways of valuing themselves, right? Yes. Um, and, and, and that the music itself, um, as our dear friend, the philosopher MacArthur genius Fred Moden has taught us many times over, the music itself has so much information in it. Mm -hmm. um, it always does, no matter what, no matter what cultural context we're talking about. For African Americans, um, it's key in the sense that we had no libraries, no archives, no museums in which to document our own history. And so the artist by necessity, the black artist by necessity is both, you know, and this comes up in the book quite a bit, both an archive and a critic. They have to operate, operate as the repository of historical memory, but so often they're also, um, you know, kind of meditating on the form itself as well, right? Um, and so it's it's always kind of steeped in the historical and political framework in which we understand black culture, that those two roles go hand in hand. 
Um, and then I will just say though, to, to go back to the Stan issue with you, that one <laughs> of the things that I, that inspired me to write the book in the way that I did was to really pay attention to the craft of both the musician and the critic, that mm -hmm. there really is a craft to being a critic. And, you know, A.O. Scott, Tony Scott, who's the, the son of a great feminist historian, um, Joan Scott, in, in his own book about um, criticisms and critics really you know, makes that point very clear that there's a kind of invisible craft to doing criticism, especially arts criticism, that if you pay very close attention to it, um, you know, is it approximates something like the kind of artistry of the musician, right? Yeah, and that's yes. Fred Moden, of course, is a great example of that because, Absolutely. you know, he's working formalistically as a poet um, to write about Cecil Taylor and um, to manifest the the radical avant-garde aesthetics of Cecil Taylor in 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 um, the written work itself. Um, yeah. yeah. And your book, and I just want to remind everyone listening, you can purchase the book uh, through City Lights. <laughs> yes. Uh, website. I think there's a way to find it and you should absolutely because there's so much, I mean, there's no one more than Daphne Brooks who realizes the craft and art of criticism as well. It's just a joy to always read, read your prose. Um, I, I want to talk about Zora Neale Hurston for a moment. Awesome. Uh, you have a long section uh, about her uh, in the Side A, your book is divided into side A and side B. Yes. Shout out to Nate Young, my, my creative <laughs> editor, who helped me think uh, that through. Yeah. I love that. And um, so she really emerges as a model of the fluidity and cross pollination between, yes. among archival inquiry, deep listening, and performance that emerges as, I'm going to use the term deliberately, a kind of new criticism mm -hmm. that can serve us better than the lineage we have now. Now, Zora is not an underground figure. She's, you know, right. everyone reads now. Watching God. Yes, now. Her, Since her Alice Walker recuperated her. And right? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But she's one of these figures that, and this is, this resonates with me strongly because Turning the Tables, the project that uh, at NPR that I helmed, uh, we try to honor figures who are hidden in plain sight, just as yes. you here. Can you talk a little bit about, um, about writing about someone like Zora, who yeah. is in some ways hidden in plain sight. Yes, yeah, no, that's really beautiful, and thank you. And I and I have to thank uh, the great American Studies scholar, uh, now emeritus Harvard, Harvard professor um, Werner Solers, Glenda Carpio, who uh, is also we could we could spend time just talking <laughs> about Berkeley in relation to rock music criticism, black studies in this project. Uh, so maybe we'll get to that. <laughs> um, you know, we're all Cal alums, and and Glenda went to Cal, and then uh, it teaches at Harvard and uh, writes about um, has an amazing book about um, African American humor. Um, but she and, and Werner were the first people who came to me and said, hey, could you write about Zora's recordings? And I said, mm -hmm. this was like a decade ago. I said, Zora's recordings? What are you talking about? <laughs> um, and the Smithsonian at that point had just made more accessible her recordings from her time working for the WPA in the 1930s, going out into the field um, and immersing herself in uh, the global South. So not just um, her homeland of Florida and famously Edenville and beyond, but also Haiti, um, other parts of the Caribbean. Um, so, you know, the thing about Zora Neale Hurston is once Alice Walker um, was able to recuperate her legacy, she had been in an unmarked grave after having been this iconic figure in the Harlem Renaissance era, very close to Langston Hughes before they famously had a falling out. She was a playwright. Um, she was an ethnographer. Um, a sister went to Barnard and um, to Columbia, studied with Franz Boas, um, really revolutionizes Black anthropological studies by saying, mm -hmm. hey, you know what? I want to study my own people <laughs> and right. I, I think I can do this. And then, um, you know, late in the late in the 30s, um, writes one of the most influential now um, at the time was maligned by Richard Wright and some of the other dudes, but one of the most influential novels of the 20th century, um, Their Eyes Were Watching God. Um, and that's what she was kind of known for in this, the recuperation of her legacy. So yes. hidden in plain sight, absolutely. The fact that she not only made these recordings in the South, but took it upon herself to, again, operate as the archive, to sing the songs, to perform them and create 
value and, um, or I should, I should say create knowledge um, and critical conversation about those songs on the recordings, but also in some of her scholarly essays, which mm -hmm. I argue were kind of, kind of like liner notes. She was kind of like yeah. writing liner notes uh, to her own um, folk recordings that she made. Um, she was absolutely a polymath, you know, and um, I wanted to really pay homage to her as, you know, both a, a critic and an artist. Well, I'm glad you uh, you use the phrase liner notes because uh, I, we should talk a little bit about the title of the book and and why liner notes matter to you in a moment when liner notes may yeah. be becoming archival yeah. <laughs> themselves. I mean, although yeah. there are interesting sites of revival and and mm -hmm. arguably, right. uh, you know, there's a flourishing of of kind of yes. the kind of inquiry that liner notes that used to happen mostly in liner notes is now happening all over the web and right uh, you know that's right yeah but but let's talk about liner notes a little yeah. bit why why liner notes for the revolution? yeah well we are the children of vinyl and um <laughs> before we started this conversation with um our wonderful community here we were bonding over our time in tower records you worked yes. at tower records i could never I get a job at tower records so i wanted one <laughs> Um, you know, having having gone to Berkeley, there the golden age of Telegraph Avenue and yes. Rasputin's and the Namiba Records, um, also important to me. And I grew up in, um, I like to call it shallow alto, but because um, <laughs> <laughs> Berkeley was the, the where I fled to. But um, having grown up on the on the peninsula, actually Menlo Park, specifically Grail Marcus, who is dear to both of us, mm. also from Menlo Park, and. Um, uh, the one of the largest high records for a time was in Los Altos, and I spent um, a chunk of change in um, many years there. Um, but I, oh, what was my? I thought lost my train of thought. We were talking about oh, we're talking about notes. liner notes. Yes. Like, okay. Right. Liner notes. <laughs> yeah, liner notes. Exactly. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted to pay, I wanted to pay homage to the form because it is a form that, you know, as at its most historically was a promotional form, um, you know, here's what you should buy this record, but then became a really kind of avant-garde form of yes. music criticism, right? Yes. Um, that both the artists themselves sometimes think Frank Zappa, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Think the problematic, deeply problematic John Fay, um, <laughs> you know, um, think yes. John Coltrane, you know, yes. um, at mid-century were, you know, using um, the sight of the notes to be able to kind of work out the kind of amplified sense of the vision of the album um, to create a kind of dialectical, um, critical and aesthetic space. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have the, like the golden age of um, jazz um, um, music criticism and the notes of like the extraordinary Nat Hentoff and yes. um, the, the polarizing Leonard Feather, <laughs> you know, right? Well, yeah. whole, whole range, I'm sure people on the call on the City Lights call are gonna have a lot to say about that. But, um, <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I really consumed that form, um, even as it was changing by the time I was coming up in, you know, the 80s and, and the 90s. Um, but I wanted to be able to think about what it would mean to write a, a kind of critical history of that kind of capacious form of popular music culture that we've been talking about as though I were writing alongside it, like the notes, um, and right. to really, to use the notes form to pick up on the lower frequencies to cite Ralph Ellison, um, all of these different figures who contribute to the makings of black women in popular music culture. Now, the other inspiration for the notes uh, was the great Rosetta Wrights, who has a chapter in this book. Um, it is her chapter, she owns it. I was honored to be able to write her story. Um, she is, uh, she was a white Jewish, um, New Yorker, who, as she liked to tell the story in the late 70s, was writing a book about menopause and started listening to Bessie Smith and then became outraged that she couldn't find all of the classic blues women's um, recordings in print. And so she really, through community support um, and through her own chutzpah, was able to come up with um, the funds to start her own label, Rosetta Records absolutely historic first um, blues feminist re um, indie record label, maybe the first and only still. Um, but the thing about Rosetta Wright's in addition to bringing all of that music um, back to uh, making it more accessible to the masses, she wrote these absolutely uh, just 
electrifying second wave feminist um, liner notes to mm -hmm. the recordings of Ida Cox and Ethel Waters and Dinah Washington, um, and was really kind of working out a kind of blues feminist criticism um, to suggest that, hey, we, we need a, a critical lexicon to be able to talk about and value this music. And as a feminist, I mean, she just like devoted her entire life to being an, an ally of black women musicians and to elevating as she used the word and, or I'm paraphrasing, but that was kind of her intent to elevate um, um, this music and intellectualize it in a way that could stand with um, the greatest works of art in the West as she believed it to be. And I was so, uh, I was just absolutely thrilled to see that chapter on Rosetta Rice because when I worked at Tower Records, I discovered women's blues of the twenties through those compilations. Yes. The wild yes. women don't have the blue, don't get yes. the blues and mean mothers. Mean mothers. And, yeah. and when you're talking about, she elevated it, but with, and I don't want to say, but, and with such a spirit of fun and, yes. and, you know, breaking boundaries yes. and excess in a beautiful yes. way. And yes. uh, so I was just She's thrilled incredible, to see incredible, Right. And she was a public historian. She would yeah. run all of these events where she was getting Sippy Wallace and big mama Thornton to come yeah. out of retirement, to give them their dues. I mean, she was just an amazing woman. And so it's just such an honor to be able to write about her. And the thing about her too, to go back to archives, since we started with that, she really believed in self archiving. I mean, this is a woman yeah. who had left behind 67 boxes of notes and marginalia and photographs and they're housed at Duke University. Um, so that kind of self archiving, that kind of sense of these women in, in this book um, having to do the work of being their own historical archives yes. and how documents. Did you, how home. did you even come across her? Like how did- That is a really great question. Oh my God, no, I have an answer. <laughs> You're another great <laughs> black feminist. Um, the, the, the great black feminist, Hazel Carby, who um, is my senior um, scholar um, colleague, I should say, senior superstar scholar at Yale, um, just became emeritus at Yale, has a, an award-winning um, autobiography that she just wrote that came out last year, but has written many other things, including a really germinal early essay on blues women's um, music in relation to the Harlem Renaissance. Um, when she got to Yale, she'd been teaching at Wesleyan in the 80s, and in the late 80s, she moved to, to teach at Yale. And she um, ordered all of the Rosetta records for the Yale library. Oh, wow. And then when I came up to teach my first class at Yale, I had been teaching in the desert at Princeton for um, many years. <laughs> Sorry for any Princeton alums on the line. <laughs> Fine, um, but I'm very happy at Yale. Um, <laughs> when I came up to teach a class at Yale, it was, on, it was my first class that I taught on black women and popular music um, culture that became the seeds for the book. Um, Hazel took me out to lunch and said, well, you, you have to go listen to the Rosetta records. And when I got there to actually see the notes, I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna have to teach the class in such a way that my students can one, handle vinyl, right? <laughs> and, and two, handle the notes and, and yeah. think about this as a part of their critical experience with the music. So, oh, I love it. so hats off to Hazel Carby as always. I, I was also uh, thrilled to see you um, exploring the, the work of Phil Garland. And you, know, you, you talk a lot about uh, black women critics who have been completely forgotten. And, yes. and I mean, specifically critics, not redefinition yes. of critics, but women journalists. Yes. And, and, but Phil Garland has, it's always haunted me. And this is a mm -hmm. moment when I say, mm -hmm. uh, mea culpa to, to her spirit, because when I co-edited Rock She Wrote with Eva McDonald, we did not include her. And that was a mistake, you know, mm -hmm. it was a terrible mistake. Mm -hmm. I have some ideas about why that would have happened, mm -hmm. but I wonder what you think. So tell us a little bit about Phil Garland such an important voice in yes. music writing, yeah. yet rarely anthologized. Right. Till now, really, you are helping recuperate her and, and you know, bringing her back to readers. So yeah, I, I think she's having a resurgence. I mean, yeah. there are some other people who are writing about soul music who've, who found her too, which is good. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, I will say just to the anecdote that you gave about her not being included in rock she wrote everyone should go out and find rock she wrote the <laughs> absolutely germinal study um that gives us the anthology of you know uh, women writing about popular music it's extraordinary um oh, thank you but i but you know i i there were people that did not end up in the book that i went oh my god for yes. instance i just interviewed her this weekend weekend as i'm working on a piece about 
other women who wrote the liner notes in the liner notes genre and and won Grammys, of which you can count them on one hand. Right. Now. Um, but one of those people, Talani Davis. I'm yes, like, I know. What were the hell? In the I book. don't know. <laughs> should have been. I mean, I, and, I gotta have a. I, I gotta get Evelyn on the phone and talk to her about that. <laughs> yeah. No. Because well, no. So I'm saying this for me. Yeah. Uh, what was that? Oh. Oh, oh yeah. No, wait, is Tulani and Rakshi wrote? Anyway, I digress. Tulani's, but, uh, a, Tulani's a footnote in this because she's the first woman to win in the liner notes right, category for yes, the Atlantic yes. Records box set for yes, Aretha, yes. right? I but, think she is in Rakshi wrote. We're so voice centered. I think she is too. Yeah, but I'm all I'm sure. saying is, you know, these, yes. these, these women, these thinkers who were kind of, they were just out doing the work, right? Yes, and so, right. you know, they did not, and we can talk about this within academia too, yeah. the women who are doing the labor and who you might lose track of because they're yes. not always on MSNBC yes. doing commentary. Um, yes. So, yes. Yes. Um, sure. and that was very specific. It wasn't, there was <laughs> very, no, well, who my mom who does noted. commentary and somebody else, <laughs> whatever, yes. at any yes. rate. And yes. there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but there are there are women who so um I uh, Phil Garland was the music critic for Ebony. Um, but she was also she late in her career, she was teaching in Columbia journalism. She also wrote um this just phenomenal um study of soul called The Sound of Soul, which was inspired by um Amiri Baraka's blues people. I mean, overtly so. Um, she was a black feminist thinker, um, she was also an archivist. Um, her papers are at Indiana University. Um, Portia Malsby, the great black uh, um, feminist um, ethnomusicologist, um, had much to do with, um, you know, maintaining Phil Garland's papers. And she also wrote lectures, you know, because like Abby Lincoln and, and mm -hmm. other figures in my book, as a public figure and a public historian like Rosetta Wright, she was, she was out, you know, delivering her ideas to the broader public, believed in pushing beyond institutions to reach the people to talk about black music. And one of the things that um, is so radical and um, inspiring about Phil Garland um, alongside some of the other figures in early in the book is that she was really mindful of the ways that criticism was so dominated by men and by white men writing about yes. black music. Yes. And, you know, so she was kind of writing about it informally in her journals and then in lectures, but it was really, it was like a thing that these women actually recognized that their work was being handled by people, you know, not of their own. Yes. And, um, you know, that, 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 that is a problem <clears throat> that should begin and end with you're not black and a woman, so you shouldn't write about this. At least that's not what I'm suggesting in my book. It's, I'm trying to say in my book, handle with care, you yeah, know, yeah, actually do some, do some work around what it means to think about where this music comes from. You know, what are the socio-historical material, political conditions that produce the music in the first place? And Phil Garland was absolutely committed to that. And be in dialogue, you know, be in dialogue constantly. And that, right. that you... I'm going chapter by chapter and I know like I, I know the clock. First of all, I want to say thank you to Paul Yamazaki for noting that Tulani Davis is nothing but the music uh, book has just been published. I went to a great yes. event with her and Jessica Hagedorn and all these other people. It's amazing. I did a book that. launch with her. Fred Moden and I did that. Yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll stay tuned for that because I have some things to say about that amazing book in relation to the liner notes genre. I, I have a deadline for that coming oh, up. Oh, good. I can't you, you know about this piece, <laughs> Anne, that I'm trying yes. to like work on. So yeah, yeah. Yes. She's, but yes, everybody should buy from City Lights Talani's um, latest yes. collection. She's extraordinary. Yeah. She's, she's, she's extraordinary. amazing. But Amazing. but uh, also you uh, you know the dialogue the kind of imaginary uh, long play dialogue that you create mm -hmm. between Ellen Willis and Lorraine Hansberry mm -hmm. that you know who did have a brief encounter but yes. I love how you I mean to me that's such a beautiful metaphor for uh, what we need to be doing now we thinkers yes. and lovers of music need to be doing yeah. is is yeah. have these dialogues really. Yes ongoing yeah so, yeah so I, no. I thank you for that i think thank ellen you. would thank you for that i i no. think if she were with us today oh my but. gosh ellen i mean i've i you know 
yeah, thank you for bringing me to Ellen's work. You were one of the folks who said, because I think I was like, you know, again, to go back, I stand you, Ann Powers. And you were like, <laughs> no, 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 you should be standing, Ellen Willis. <laughs> and then our, our dear mutual friend, Daphne Carr, and um, her, you know, Ellen's extraordinary daughter, Nona Aronowitz, were, you know, two of the key figures. And um, 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 Nagy, Evie Nagy, right? Evie Nagy, yeah. Um, yeah, we're bringing, we're, bringing we're Ellen's really, work back. Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're yeah. 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 And I just, you know, in the archive, uh, in Ellen's archive at the Schlesinger Library at Harvard, um, there is uh, an article that she wrote when she was an undergrad at Barnard um, about hitching her wagon to Lorraine Hansberry, right at the height of Lorraine Hansberry's fame, the Raisin in the Sun. They never met again, as far as we know. Um, but I wanted to make their work speak to each other and show how their work speaks to each other in a kind of broad-based way of thinking about radical feminisms and the importance of culture writing in relation to black radical tradition thought and radical black feminist thought. So, uh, yeah. I want, uh, again, I'm gonna say buy Daphne's books from City Lights. I, I'm just putting a little ad in, but you can see how much is in this book. I mean, really this book could be your companion uh, you're, you know, sit it next to your bedside and pick it up instead of your phone because you don't, don't need to be looking at your phone. Uh, this thing will take you through the rest of the pandemic and it, beyond. It, it, it will. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I want to get to side B because here we are okay. 40 minutes in, 50 minutes yes. in. I haven't even wow. brought us to side B. Wow. Um, yeah. uh, do you want to read a little bit uh, from it? Sure. Or? You mean yeah. like a like a yeah, graph, set us up, a graph? Set us up. and, and, okay. and wh while you're finding the page I'll say to anyone if you want to put a question in the chat I, I have you know I could go on all night but pretty soon I'm going to open it up to all y'all we'll just keep going so uh put please please add a question in the chat if you have one side b we are engaged in a beautiful struggle to take back that which belongs to us to get closer to the multitudes that we missed and the dear ones that we miss. Such a battle requires that we think, dream, plot, and prepare ourselves to write from an angular position, to generate critical tales that run askew from the standard script. Such an effort demands that we stretch the limits of our imagination and test the boundaries of the speculative. This is the kind of experimental endeavor that makes it possible to draft avant-garde liner notes in the language of Afrofuturist androids and to compose regional folk odes to the quixotic elsewhere, like the kind made by polymath contrarians. Such questing and querying modes of the expressive are the forms we might summon to imperfectly approximate the artistic passions of, say, a solitary postbellum music critic or the wished for conversations between disparate feminist radicals. We rehearse, we research, and we narrate the impossible and possible, parentheses. Mm -hmm. We entertain valid conjectures, compelling theories of the what if, would be scenarios and alternate endings. And above all else, we turn to the music that warrants our scrupulous black feminist attention, our inspired notes drafted from a variety of different perspectives and sounded out in as many keys as we might dare to play at once. Beautiful. So side B, you enter into the story more uh, in a particular way, Daphne. I do. Um, mm -hmm. you, uh, you enact the beautiful struggle by entering into the archive yourself mm -hmm. and uh, take, ha going on a bit of a he hero's journey and, um, and, and posing some challenges and in, act, in fact, engaging uh, particularly around, you, you know, not, there's many stories in side B, but the stories of uh, Gishi Wiley and, and uh, L.V. Thomas. Yes. And you, uh, it, it is a remarkable work of revisionist critique and history because you show us the process and mm -hmm. you actually even engage with those whom you are critiquing. Specifically, like you actually have conversations with you mentioned Griot, but like John Jeremiah Sullivan, John who wrote Jeremiah the famous, Sullivan. 
piece about uh, Gishi and Elvi in yeah. the New York Times magazine. And you yeah. got y'all are talking in this book. You're talking. We are. So, I mean, <laughs> We've had conversations. <laughs> yeah. So where's my were, drink? <laughs> <laughs> I know that's for the after party. But uh, uh, were you thinking about how revisionist history itself has to be done differently to engender mm -hmm. uh, Black women sonic studies when you were going on this hero's journey? Yeah, thanks for that question. I'm not sure I thought of it that way, but I did think about, um, I mean, Fred, our friend Fred, um, talks quite a bit about fellowship and mm -hmm. what it means to cultivate fellowship in our thinking worlds and in our classrooms. And, you know, one of the questions I had was, you know, how do we continue to cultivate fellowship outside of the classrooms and in our projects with one another? So, you know, we referenced Grail earlier. I mean, the Grail is all over this book and I don't think he's on this call. If he is, I hope he knows that I just, my work doesn't exist without the road that he paved and the model that he set. And I wanted to be able to think ethically about, we talk about this in the Academy through another former Berkeley professor. She ends up doing kind of her late work at, at Duke before she passes away, but Eve Sedgwick, the late, mm -hmm great um, queer feminist theorist, or she was a, a feminist theorist of queer studies, I should say. Um, Eve Sedgwick wrote about these ideas about writing alongside and thinking alongside and being alongside one another, that that's mm -hmm. a kind of ethical practice rather than you know being at odds with one another. Right, absolutely. And I really wanted side B to be that in those first few chapters. I wanted to be able to stage or I guess maybe um, lay claim to and document the struggle um, over you know, these so-called lost blues women, um, our fascination with them that's shared completely, how we handled um, the remains of what was left behind um, by these women. Um, and I wanted to really wrestle with the different kinds of approaches that we each were taking. And mm -hmm. ultimately, I mean, John and, and, and Grail became kind of models for ways of handling their work that I think is really important, both on the creative end with Grail and on the just, you know, prodigious Cracker Jack research. <laughs> and that, yeah. You know, John Jeremiah Sullivan, just nobody digs like John Jeremiah Sullivan. And um, his assistant though. And his assistant, <laughs> Caitlin Love, right? <laughs> You know, and but there were so many battles between um, John and that are now well documented in deep walk circles and Robert McCormick, who's passed along and uh, passed mm -hmm. on now and who was a, you know, a kind of um, informal blues ethnographer at this massive, um, you know, archive that he kept in his home and jealously protected and locked right. down and, you know, it's very complicated. Um, so I wanted to sort of think about what, what gets pushed to the wayside when those struggles are front and center. I wanted to figure out where, not necessarily where the women were, but to pay more attention to why we maybe don't know their story, mm -hmm. you know, as in like right. structures of racial and gender subjugation. Yes. Um, and then yes. to try and tell a different story that honored their silences in the archive yeah. that maybe um, didn't necessarily continue on the hunt, but allowed us to gently turn our attention to women who loved their music or music like that and girls who yeah. loved music like that. And that included someone like my mother, my 94 yeah. year old mother, Palo Alto Menlo Park. She may be on the call. She may not be <laughs> at this point. Um, she would say, I didn't listen to blues music, but I listened to R&B. But the point being as, as a 94 year old black woman who survived the Jim Crow South, she was part of a generation of young women, Toni Morrison writes about them in her majestic novel, Jazz, who you know created meaning um, and full life worlds out of the music. The music was world-making for them. And world-making was absolutely necessary if you were gonna survive this world of tyranny and terror that told you every day that you weren't a citizen and that you didn't matter. Um, and I thought, well, there are a lot of scratches in these Gishi and LV recordings. Mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, who played these records, who put the scratches in them first, you know? And I love that. I, that was, you, you basically asked yourself the next question I had, which was about bringing your family in. And yeah. what I love about that beautiful chapter uh, about uh, black girls and record stories, and you also weave in the story of a, of a blogger 
um, what's her name? Marsha Music, right? From Detroit. Oh, she's incredible in Detroit. <laughs> yeah, daughter of this like family that ran a really iconic record store. Shout out to Michael Dyson who helped me get back to her. Yeah. But I, I mean, I love the way that you you open this space for us, which for me, uh, it, it made me think of a, a phrase I think of a lot, which is that one person's margin is another person's center. Yes. And, you know, that often, and this made me want to shout out Maureen Mann and her incredible mm -hmm. book, Black Diamond Queens, that came out yep. uh, recently, yep. but which really, in the, especially in the early rock and roll chapter, shows mm -hmm. that I think especially for white feminist writers mm -hmm. like myself, uh, writers who think that they are pointing out exclusion, mm -hmm. by pointing out exclusion, sometimes you're reinforcing exclusion. And what's yeah. beautiful about that chapter is you're saying, you know, I mean, the way that uh, ra the existence of race records is rightly always disparaged. Mm -hmm. Here right. is a world that was created right. out, you know, despite. Yes, that. absolutely. That, I absolutely love that. So yeah, no, thank you. That. You know, it's just about expanding the universe of questioning what's possible and what has existed in popular music culture is so exciting yeah. for us all I, to think about. Uh, well, I just want one last shout out to anyone who wants to ask a question. Oh, there's a Karen saying Martian music is so ignored. And hey. hi, Karen, by the way. <laughs> uh, ask us a couple questions, folks. It's we're you know, here we are. Like pretend we're uh, sitting <laughs> here around we having a having a drink, you know, having having some no. uh, some cookies, something, Means you know. That. And uh, and then talking out, but I will ask you one more question. I have two can, more. Can I can I say before you ask the question that yeah. I do wish that we were in, obviously in you know one of the greatest bookstores in the world and oh, a, a place that is so you know dear to our hearts. I will say yeah. that for me and my other half, Matthew Fry Jacobson, it's the last bookstore we were in before the pandemic. We've gone oh, home wow. to visit mom, and I gave a talk at Cal, and we're like, we got to go to City Lights, <laughs> you know. So I love um, it how we wish we were there right now yeah well here's a, here uh here's a question I, I katie thank you for that and i'm mm -hmm. going to ask one more question about the book and then we're going to talk about process i think that's a great way to go um okay. in our last minutes but yep. you do identify this generation of peers daphne um yep. artists sonic adventurers and archivists like janelle monet mm -hmm. rhiannon giddens valerie june cecile mcclure and salvant mm -hmm. um there's always a risk in writing about very contemporary artists in a book there because, is. you know i always think about ellen willis yeah. uh championing this artist miss claudie oh and yeah miss claudie right here she, she loved her some miss claudie and she's like this is the greatest you know the one who will be <laughs> of course it's the only time anyone's ever heard of yeah her. but yeah um, how did you make those choices to uh celebrate Ooh, those? wow that's a great that's an ann powers question <laughs> well you know the thing about all of them i will say with janelle monet that she's you know even in the time that it took me to write this book her career has obviously taken all sorts of twists and turns and and, and transformations you know she's a movie star now which which she was probably already on that trajectory yeah but you know i was paying attention to her early 2010 notes it's important to, in terms of thinking about fellowship, she, it's important to acknowledge that she works um, collaboratively with her Wonderland associates, Chuck yes. Lightning and Nate Wonder and Roman yes. G and Arthur, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> so those notes are really kind of a collective process. And I did, I did speak about that, but I tried to acknowledge the fact that she's sort of a, a moving, a figure who continues to evolve. And I wanted to mark that moment in her career mm. when the literary side of her mythology was important to her. So she's a little bit kind of historicized in the book, mm, um, but yeah. those other figures are kind of interesting. Cecile, um, greatest jazz vocalist of the past quarter yeah. century, if not Absolutely. longer. <laughs> uh, Anna Giddens, the, you know, the icon of uh, roots musicking um, and Absolutely. contemporary yeah. folk. And Valerie June, who we adore so much, yes. um, our late dog just, you know, actually he responded to her voice. Oh. Like, no, <laughs> there's a great <laughs> record coming out soon too. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, she, and we got to tell her that our, our dog who, you know, our chocolate lab, when he was a puppy, he would only calm down to her voice when she oh. came to Yale. And of course she loved that, but, um, you know, folk, um, blues, indie, everything. Um, I, you know, the three of them I write about as archivists, um, very specifically the ways that they are very mindfully caring for um, the, these, these 
uh, you know, music long forgotten or repressed music from our past, our, Amer our shared American past, as, we, as, as Ken Burns might put it, right? <laughs> and they are kind of like the, the alternative, you know, black yes. feminist, right? Reimaginings yes. of Ken Burns, if we even, if I should use a black doctor <laughs> instead, right? Yes. Um, but because they, they are, are so fearless in uh, addressing um, the, the histories of racial subjugation that inform the makings of the music itself. Yes. And because of that, I felt that they, they stand the test of time because they're already <laughs> historians. And weirdly, and I probably should have addressed this more, um, but you know, two out of three of them are MacArthur's and yes. Valerie should be too. So they yes. kind of have been pulled into institutional legibility, That's true. Uh, which makes me, you know, both happy for them to have more money and also, ooh, institutions. Um, <laughs> but you know, if they, they, they are clearly devoted to using the, that kind of, um, those kinds of resources to expanding our imagination with our moral imagination to use yes. Toni Morrison's, um, um, a beautiful formulation associated with Toni Morrison. So. Yes, yes, yeah. well said. Well, they're great choices. As far as I'm concerned, they will all stand the test of time. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. And interesting, I, 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 we have our two questions. I'm going to get to that, but I just want to okay. share an anecdote about Janelle. So I wrote, mm -hmm. I think, the first national profile of her when, right. and, I, and I went for the LA Times and yep. Uh, I went to Wonderland to the house. Oh my God. I know in, in Atlanta, I drove there. I was living in Alabama and I drove there to <laughs> Atlanta and it is, it was this incredible, uh, communal yes. collaborative and even yes. like every choice felt collaborative. Yes. every choice, like the books yes. they had on the shelves that, which they had yes. a Greg Tate book on the shelf. I remember. So oh much. no. I um, mean. <laughs> Chuck and Nate studied like Sartre and Du Bois at exactly. Morehouse. Yeah, exactly. they came to one of my classes once and gave a lecture at Princeton. No, they're brilliant. Yeah. But but yes. she was like this, you know, the, it was fascinating to see how they worked in a, yes, a, a, you know, as this multi yes. headed hydra kind of. Exactly. I'm glad you pointed that out. And I hope I honored that in the section that I wrote about the notes because yes. it, it is really a process of dialectical exchange, right? Yes. And wonder, yeah, wonder, wonderland, yeah. So let's turn to our questions. Uh, Katie asks, uh, she says, I'm a creative writing student. Right on, I studied um, creative yeah, writing at San yeah. Francisco State University. Oh, that's, that's my great. Major, um, yeah. As an undergrad. And I'd love to hear more about your process for developing mm -hmm. Your beautiful mm -hmm. prose. Oh, well, that is very kind. Um, this is the moment when I get to talk about one of the most important communities that Anne and her other half, Eric Weisbard, <laughs> brought into being. And that if I want to kind of go deep genealogy, seem to be connected to an earlier event that our dear mutual friend Sonnet Rettman and I also had organized a conference when we were in grad school at UCLA called Discord on popular music culture. And we invited not only um, academics, but also our favorite critics like Anne and Eric, right? Um, and musicians. Uh, yes. There was uh, Jennifer Finch from L7 came. I tried to yes. get- uh, Franklin Bruno was there. Yeah, well, Franklin was, I mean, he's an academic. He a, he's, he's also a musician, but yeah. he was like my, my, my ex-college boyfriend's roommate, like back in the day. So that's the whole nother thing. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, there were a whole, there, it was, a, it was, it became like a precursor to what Anne and Eric led and continued to lead in spirit, if not literally having to do the nuts and bolts of this um, for 20 years that we still call it the Experience Music Project Museum as it was originally known in Seattle, an annual pop conference that actually, you know, we, we talk about how there, there's a kind of EMP style of, of writing, right? Yeah, um, er, yeah. Early in that conference's history, um, the, the scholar and poet, Josh uh, Clover, um, mm -hmm. invited you and me, Anne, and also Grail. Um, I always get mixed up with who was in, I think Oliver Wang. Yeah. Um, yeah, think, right. Yeah. Speaking of who is helming the conference this year, by the way, Oliver exactly. is running the conference this year. Yes, no, which it's is fantastic. April. It's going to be online. Keep yes. an eye out. We'll, yeah, we'll keep an eye out for that. So Josh um, gave us a prompt and said, you know, I want to do this session called Critical Karaoke, and I want you to pick a song that's important to you. You could love it, you could hate it, but, you know, I want you to write about it. It can be personal, it can, it can and should be critical, but it has to be no longer than the length of the song itself. 
Um, and we're going to call it Critical Karaoke, and um, you know we're going to do this as a as an as an event, as a as a session at the conference. And it was just transformative in terms of really challenging you to be, at least for me, to be really economical with my with my prose and trying to think in terms of. I mean, this gets my my English PhD past whatever. Um, think in terms of synecdoche, so a part of a whole. Like what what yeah. are the kind of and this is what all great music critics can do is to compress images that are resonant and lead you down a variety of different paths. And um, I believe Van Utro's Alfie. Yes. Alfie. Yeah, I still remember <laughs> that. And that was right after you'd become a mom. Yeah. And um, and I chose um, Journey's Lights. Yes. Which, um, you know, had journey. nothing to do with being a Journey fan. No, no shade for Journey. It just it was because that song Lights, which I got to tell Steve Perry at, uh, at the more recent conference <laughs> in, a couple of years ago. He came. He was on the keynote. Yeah. He was on a keynote, and I introduced him, and I was like, "Hey, man, he's actually in my critical karaoke because." I saw him at the ballpark. My sister, um, Renelle, who in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, you all know her as an icon who is the voice of the San Francisco Giants. And um, our dad had just passed away um, and we went to the ballpark and um, Steve Perry was sitting not far away from me, huge Giants fan. And I was working on this piece and you know, ended up talking to him about lights for a minute and incorporated <laughs> into this kind of meditation on growing up in the Bay Area um, and, and understanding the relationship between me being a child of the Bay Area and my parents being um, from the Jim Crow South and going back and forth in the summers to Texas and Arkansas and coming back to the Bay Area and, and really thinking about how weird it was to grow up in San Francisco in the 70s with Patty Hearst and the right. People's Temple and... <laughs> You know, crazy times. just crazy times, right? But to answer your question, Katie, um, it 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 was the opportunity to try to compress all of that history, um, you know, in in the in the course of the song, and so it was about trying to lean into big feelings and um, powerful images. And for me, that's always how I like to write um, in the fashion of liner notes to write really close to the music to write alongside. Mm -hmm. The performer and try to be in the event of the recording itself so well said well said so pay attention to the details katie and feel what you feel and then think about how to carry that feeling into the writing mm -hmm. uh, equally powerful uh as your ideas um mm -hmm. jane Subi says renelle's your sister so cool <laughs> it's true <laughs> It's true. I get that a lot. I get that a lot. Yeah. Rich B Different. says Sherry Tucker gave a shout out to Daphne's book a couple hours ago on a jazz at Lincoln Center online mm -hmm. class covering the international sweethearts of rhythm. Talk about a pioneer. Uh, absolutely. I, I want to get to Paul's question, which yes. now has gone on a screen where I can't read it. But Paul asks you about Aretha and the binary mm -hmm. split. The kind. Of, what do you think of the critical split that often honors yeah. Uh, the Atlantic recordings <laughs> at, the cost, at the cost of the Columbia recordings. Columbia recordings. Yes. I mean, my charge was from, talk about institutions from Sony, when they asked me to do the liner notes um, for the Columbia years was, you got to make people know how important <laughs> these recordings are. And um, it was very easy for me to do. I, you know, I felt like they were trying to convince me and I was like, I don't need convincing because, you know, this is an, an 18 year old young woman who many people didn't know had already, right. you know, was the mother of four, four kids at that point. Um, and so had a kind of, um, she, her, her engagement with the world was deeply complex. She's also the child of, you know, uh, religious royalty, right, <laughs> in the context of the Black church. And um, her professionalism um, combined with, you know, being immersed in this long history of Black sacred sonic aesthetics led her to a place to be, you know, very, um, you know, challenged with translating all of that into a popular secular space. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that kind of, you know, you could call it kind of graduate school that she was mm -hmm. going to at Columbia, yeah. you know, was an interesting platform to then move back into this revolutionizing, you know, transformative way in which she reinterprets and reimagines the genre of soul. I don't think you get the kind of mature um, sensual 
you know, meditations on black womanhood in the, in the Atlantic records archive without, you know, going through her kind of supper club, Mm -hmm. you know, rehearsals and Columbia at Columbia, right? Because it's still, it's about all of these different shades of being what it means to be socially legible as a black woman in America and how to then try to calibrate that and subvert that. So Atlantic is a part of that story. It's about the subversion of all of that, you know? Beautifully said. Um, What are liner notes and why do you like to use them? We talked a little bit about that, Maya, um, but I think that might be a literal question. What are liner notes? Yeah, (laughs) I mean- I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, uh, I'm gonna uh, just slightly detour in that question to say, where can people find liner notes anyway? My gosh. Well, th- that's great. I mean, now online, you can really, you yeah. can Google, you know, right now as we speak, probably, you know, John Coltrane liner notes or Bob Dylan liner notes and they yes. will pop up. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, but I found even in this piece that I'm writing right now that I've had to order box sets quite a bit to, you know, really handle the material liner notes that I'm, that I'm trying to focus on like mm. Joni Mitchell's or like right. Talani's, right? Right, right? And right. that and that these, you know, the box set form, which is so central to the recording industry's, you know, holiday, you know, commodification, you know, yeah, extravaganza yeah. So true. is yeah. where you'll find people, you know, really working on and producing thrilling and important notes, you know? But Janelle's are, are even on Dirty Computer, she has a kind of extension of the note form that she yes. really digs into by the time you get to Arc Android. So. Yes, yeah. And, I mean, and I, there's connection. also the connection between liner notes and podcasts, I think now. The That's right. Hanif Abdurraki he did a great uh, liner notes oriented, it's he called did. Lost Notes. Lost like Notes, of, yeah. The CRW podcast. And I think Fantastic. His, his season of that, both Jessica's yeah. season, Jessica Hopper did a season and he did she one. She did, season, right. And they honor that tradition. Yes. In so fact, just, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say quickly, Jessica Hopper did a, an episode on Fahey, on John Fahey, yes. that I end up citing in my, in my <laughs> on John Fahey, which we, we don't have enough drinks. We can have now. another hour mm-hmm. to talk about that. Yes. At 9.15, I, I think we should we should probably wind it down. Of course, right. I could talk to you all night. I had one final question, and I just want to show you that yeah. there's just one word, and it is Beyonce. <laughs> ah, yes. I have a question, but I feel that I should note. That Beyonce yeah. ends both my book, Good Booty, and your Lemonade ends my book and your yep. book. And I just wondered if you wanted to just, I'm just going to say the word Beyonce. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, to go back to, to, to bring Beyonce in concert with Ralph Ellison, which mm-hmm. I always want to do if other people <laughs> aren't yet there yet, maybe they can get there here, which is to say that as, um, Ralph Ellison opens Invisible Man, those famous opening lines of the end is the beginning and it lies far ahead. And mm-hmm. lemonade, is, lemonade is really the end and the beginning. Um, and it lies far ahead of us in terms of aesthetic vision. We're still trying to catch up with her, a formulation mm-hmm. that I use in the book. Um, and so it's, it's a, I think it's a fitting place. It was fitting ending for your book. And I wanted it to be a point of possibility and an opening. It also pays homage to um, to Grill and the way that he's thinking through the basement tapes, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, you know, trying to give us an actual physical site to go, you know, to go to at the end of the book, which is New Orleans Hurricane Katrina, yeah. and how that is a compression of the entire history of this sometimes beautiful, but also a lot of times terrifying thing called America. Um, so there it is. Beautifully said. Well, on that note, I think we should say good night to all of y'all for, thanks for hanging out. Daphne, it's always Thank a joy. You. I Thank wish you, could, always. I wish I could hug your neck as we say here in I know. Nashville. <laughs> I know, we're really Nashville now, Anne. Next this year has been really Canada. lovely. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Next year in San Francisco with a Next hop over year. to the East Bay for yeah. sure. Berkeley, Berkeley. Oh my God, all the food. <laughs> Berkeley. Link to oh, buy. Someone I, is, yeah. I imagine there is a, in an alternate universe a <laughs> channel that you can flip on and this conversation just goes on. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be fantastic. It could happen. It could it'd be, it'd be, we need that. 
<laughs> Peter, Peter, I think there's some people asking um, if there's a link to buy the book, and I don't know if yeah. that's possible for City yeah, I just, In fact, it's in the chat. I, okay. I've looked at it a bunch of times. So if you if you go to the very base of the chat right now, the listing is there. So just click on it. It'll take you right to the book. Okay. Um, you know, we're going to post this on YouTube. So if you know anyone who like missed it, um, like in about a week's time, you know, and we'll be sending out emails to everybody who, um, you know, came tonight. So um, I just want to send out a little shout out to Van over at Black Sound and Archiving Working Group at Yale. Oh, yeah. and Amanda at Harvard. Oh, and Amanda. Um, yeah. you know, th Katie, thank you Katie Dunham. so much. I mean, this has been just amazing. And, and of course, every sale of, you know, a book helps City Lights continue. Yes. And, yes. you know, our reading yes. series going. Um, yeah. And I'm just going to keep this open. Any last words? To buy a book? <laughs> I just miss City Lights. Oh my gosh, that that place is home. And it's yeah. really like to I spend said, hours and hours in there. I think I spent as many hours in Vesuvio if I talk about my own uh, rather wasted youth. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, I, I love the it, the memories of lingering in there. And I thought about it a lot when I was writing a piece for the New York Times last summer on Mamie Smith and Crazy Blues, but it starts with Maya Angelou's memories, San Franciscan, mm -hmm. of, you know, working in a record store, um, I think not far from City Lights. I have to go back. Actually, Grail sent me the location. I feel like it was over off of Columbus. Hmm. Somebody will know, but she worked in a record store and she, but she talked about how she initially, she just would linger in the aisles for hours and hours. And mm. that's the beauty of these spaces, um, these culture spaces. So absolutely, you're already an institution, but um, know how much you are missed in New Haven, Connecticut. So. Well, that is, that is how I, uh, lingering in the aisles is, is how I discovered the Rosetta records for sure. Cause I was uh, briefly and strangely the blues and reggae buyer at Tower. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Ann Powers, I'm learning all this stuff. <laughs> because my friend Miles Boysen, shout out to Miles, he's in the East Bay. Uh, um, he was the blues and record uh, and reggae buyer, and he left, I guess, to go on tour with his band or something. And I inherited the job, but I would buy those records for the store. So, oh my uh, God, that's incredible. That's like Maya did a version of that. She talks about it in Singing and Swinging and Getting Married with Christmas, the, mm, the mm. third installment, I think, mm. of the memoir. Yeah. Wow. Oh, I have so, to check that out. She's I know. A multivalent figure that totally know, was in Porgy and Bass, you know. Yeah. yeah. Had a cookbook, like you know, Calypso records. Oprah's best friend. Yeah. The whole thing. <laughs> Other than Gail. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's for the next volume, right? It well, is. The next. Uh, but then we see because Daphne, we can't really do our exercise unless you have two. So. <laughs> okay. Well, there's another. There's a book on Black feminist, uh, Black feminist history of Porgy and Bess that was supposed to have been the end of this book, and it got so long I had to cut it off. <laughs> so it's pretty far along. Wow. There you go. Is that your next publish? Do you foresee that as your next published project? It is sequentially. It will have to be. Um, and then, you know, there are, I always thought there were three volumes of this. So there's right. a mid century one that's right. about black women, musicians and democracy and cosmopolitanism, Afro-cosmopolitanism with Nina and Eartha mm -hmm. and Ada James, mm -hmm. and Supremes and Tina. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is on the third reconstruction. That's mm -hmm. tentatively called all, all that you can't leave behind. Shout out oh, to our, you know, um, and really about the Knoll sisters and 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 the kind of post sixty eight ways that we think about black feminist sound. So, oh, well. so I don't know. My dean said, "Oh my God, Daphne, if you're going to do all that, you'll be in a nursing home when you're done." <laughs> I don't know. This, I, I, I think you're going to pick up the pace. I think it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, after this one, I did uh, get uh, the, <laughs> the first cut is the deepest. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Are we signing off? Is that yeah. I think we're signing off. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks so to much. everyone. Be well. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Anne, so much. Such an honor. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.